Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to TCB Radio. I'm Krista Joy, and tonight, like always, we are celebrating. Celebrating the life and memory of Elvis Presley with a mission to share his legacy with the world. It's Tuesday, October 31st, and tonight uh, we have a special guest interview for you. And we're doing something a little different because this is actually pre-recorded. So um, and Peter Alden worked all day on this video for you guys. I'm so excited. If you're tuning in live, you'll be one of the you will be the first one to see this. I haven't even seen the video, uh, but it's a fantastic interview with Kay Wheeler. Put to video, and we're going to play that for you tonight. And I will be in the comments section. If you have questions or comments, I'll be able to answer you back. But um, you will be watching with me for the first time ever on its world debut our pre recorded interview, um, phone interview with the amazing Kay Wheeler. So if you're not familiar, she was Elvis's girlfriend during the frenzied height of his early brushes with success, fame, and fortune in 1956 and 1957. She's a Rockabilly Hall of Fame inductee and the queen of rock and bop. We're going to bring her on the line right after the intro video. I need to do a quick shout out and thank you to quickproductions.com for being our sponsors and also to Lee Douglas of Old Time Rock and Roll for converting the show to iTunes. Don't forget you guys to hit the share button, share the video tonight. Uh, your friends and family will thank you. And with that, I guess I'll go ahead and turn the camera out and you're gonna see a black screen, then the intro video will come on and then our big show tonight with Kay Wheeler. So here we go. before we have on the line for you tonight the very first national Elvis Presley fan club president his former girlfriend and so much more queen of the rock and bop the fabulous Kay Wheeler Kay welcome to the show well thank you oh my I may not be able to speak after that introduction <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know you get asked this question a lot. The very first question that opens everything up. How did the Elvis fan club come about? The Elvis fan club was like everything exciting with Elvis. It, it was out of the box. It was not like you would normally sit down in a circle and say, let's start a fan club. Uh, it was more like a happening. And that's what makes it all so much fun. A long story short, my, uh, my aunt was the assistant to the a top executive that owned radio station KLIF in Dallas. And they figure into my story very big in a later time. But anyway, uh, we had we had just I had already kind of heard of Elvis Presley and, and heard him on the big D Jamboree there in Dallas. You know, he was just a ragtag country singer guy. It was one of the guys on the bill. I had heard him sing Mystery Train one night over the radio, but I didn't know what he looked like or anything. I thought, but I knew that I had heard something that was like, wasn't like anything that I'd ever heard before. Even though I was into black rock and roll with the Midnight Hank Ballard and the Midnighters and you know Bass Domino and uh, the Clovers and some of the great. Of groups, we were already bopping, and, and teenagers at that time had already gotten into rock and roll in a very underground way. 
but, but when I heard Mystery Train at night, I was looking for a black radio station, accidentally hit the Big Degenerated, because this is Elvis Presley. And I thought, what a strange name. But <laughs> listen to me, it was like, like, like somebody just picked you up and took you on a trip. And my eyes just was just so all wide open. My sister was there with me. We just looked and stared at the radio like, what is that? And so, you know, we didn't really think anything about it. We're 16 year old kids, you know. You know, and, you know, she's two years younger. We're just young teenagers. And so, um, a little later, I was at a record shop and I looked over to a poster. And there was a poster uh, advertising Mystery Train. It was a yellow poster and it showed this unbelievably good looking kid, a guy leaning back singing it said Elvis Presley. And I was like, oh no, it can't <laughs> sound like that, look like that at the same time. You know? <laughs> And, you know, Guys so have been trying I, to do I, it ever I, since without success. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I thought, hey, this is double trouble if there ever was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was just a little poster piece of paper. So I just took the paper, folded it up, put it in my books. We were all, we, you know, we were on the way to school. <laughs> and so I was just amazed at it. I just couldn't believe it. So then uh, later on in that week or shortly thereafter in study hall that my friend was talking about, she said, hey, have you heard about this guy down in Gladewater? He's like, you know, shaking his leg. He's like the best looking thing you've ever heard in your life. And all the, it, it, it was a buzz going over Texas, okay? Mm-hmm. It was a teenage buzz that was kind of like, we didn't have Facebook or the internet, but we just was kid to kid, teen to teen. And she said, and his name is Elvis Presley. And I'm I'm thinking, I've got his poster in my book here. And I've heard him on the BB Jam Green. And I thought, and then my eyes even got bigger than ever. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one uh, one Saturday, sometimes my Aunt Billy would take his kids. And when she was working on Saturday, she'd let me come along or tag along, me and my sister. And we'd just kind of go and play around the radio station. And she, she was just a great auntie. And... Uh, so this disc jockey comes in her office and he says, you won't believe what we got in today. We got this record by this guy. And guess what his name is? Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> he lay back and laughed. And my eyes just got huge. I said, Elvis Presley? And he says, you can't. What? He says, that's the corniest thing anybody had. Nobody will ever get anywhere with that name. <laughs> and he was just talking to my aunt there. And I was just sitting there listening. And I said, Oh, he's going to be a huge star. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and, and before I knew what I was saying, I said, I have a fan club anyway, you know, so he's he's going to be a big star. Like, in my mind, I was going to do it a trick right there. <laughs> but, you know, it was me and my sisters. We were, it, it were a few other friends. We were already freaking out over it, so that was good enough for me. I said, you know, we have a fan club. So, unknown to me, he gets my address from my aunt. And as a gag on his show that Saturday night, his name was Bruce Hayes, he announced and played the record, if you would have joined the Elvis Presley fan club, right, Kay Wheeler, and, you know, was, uh, you know gave, gave the address over the air. <laughs> and, and, and so, okay, I didn't know he did it. It was a gag. It was like a gag. Mm-hmm. But the station was uh, throughout all of Texas. It was a big radio station. It wasn't just local. And uh, so... A Monday, somehow I didn't go to school that day. I, you know, whatever. I was good at that. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, my mother comes running into me and she says, "There's stacks of mail all over the front porch of our house." I said, "What?" And she says, "And it's all addressed to you. <laughs> it's all addressed it's to you." All addressed to you. And I said, "What?" I mean, it was like, "What?" It was like a a saucer landed in the front yard or something flies up. I said, well, what is it? And I'll go out there and all these stacks and stacks and boxes of wrapped in string, stacks of letters. And I, we bring them all in. And with a family room, we sit them down and we start opening them up. And they all say, we heard the announcement about your fan club on the Bruce Hayes show. Oh <laughs> Please my send gosh. us a card. Please send us a card. Please send us a picture. And, of course, I just thought, what is this? And, then, you know, it was the freakiest thing ever. And there was hundreds of them, literally mm-hmm. hundreds of them. And so I told my mother, I said, what's a fan club? <laughs> and she said, well, I remember when I was growing up in Frank Sinatra, the 
thank uh, they had thank cards for him all the time. She said they got to sometimes times to get to meet him. I said, oh, oh, oh I see. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds right. <laughs> and so I said, well, it's a fan club, so I've got to get. They wanted cards. They, you know, they wanted a photo. And so there was. I went back and found a little poster that I take taken from the record shop, and it had an address on there, Bob Mill, in, in Memphis. And so I wrote a letter and I said, I have a fan club. I said, do you have cards? Do you have pictures? You know, I'm 16 years old, so I'm not thinking I can design and print a card. I'm not thinking like that at all. You know, that's totally, you know, off the off the table. And uh, so I, I heard nothing back. So uh, a short time thereafter, you know, maybe a week, couple, three or four weeks, I received a letter from a, a Colonel Parker's office, you know, with a great big wagon on the letterhead and you know we cover the nation colonel tom park and i thought what is that and it, apparently his secretary carolyn asma wrote it and said your letter was forwarded to us by bob neal and uh, we just want to let you know that we do not have any fan club facilities for elvis uh, you can do anything you want and we do appreciate all your efforts for elvis but elvis is just one of uh, the colonel's uh, smaller attractions his main attraction is hank snow on blah 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 carter so forth so you can do anything you want with an elvis presley fan club and i thought oh well what i do <laughs> you know it's the first thing i thought well they want cars so what's a car and you know i i had to do all of a sudden i was a graphic designer you know at 16 <sighs> and so i came up with those presley pink uh cars the, the presley pink and you know i went for the uh, you know, man, is, uh, you're the loyal member of the coolest class in the Elvis Presley fan club. Elvis is our cause. Wow, what a cause. And, uh, well, actually, Graceland reproduced that card and put it in a box, their Elvis box of collectibles, like his first report card, you know, his first check from the, the crown from Electric and, all, you know, all the highlights of his life. And my card was the first thing they had in it. Wow. So wow, I felt very cool. flattered by that because I think they basically think this is the real deal with it. This is the fan. This, this is, you know, I think Parker did a whole bunch of stuff and started commercializing the fan clubs and big cards and stuff later on when Elvis got big. But that's really the, the true deal. And actually, I sent Parker a card with his name on it, calling him the brain. <laughs> I don't know where I got. I don't know where I got it. I don't know where I got all this. It's sixteen and seventeen, but it started somewhere. So I went and got the, all a thousands of these cards printed up. And she did send me a picture. She did send me a small picture, and I, I used to could send off to picture places and get fifty pictures for like three dollars or something. Mm. And you know, so I banked it off my mother. I got some pictures. I printed the cards, and my sisters and the other people that were helping me get we answered all those hundreds of letters. So it was an instant fan club. Wow! Like Elvis, it's just like it, you know, he's it's just like a skyrocket. Mm -hmm. You know. So long story short, that's how the beginning of that fan club started. Okay, so you so you started the fan club, and you got the fan club going. Everything's running all, all cylinders now. Tell, now, uh, how long before you actually met Elvis? Okay, so within that year, within 1956, April 15th, 1956. So I was rocking and rolling with a fan club, and we were having rock and roll parties and playing Elvis music, and uh, we were into rock and roll as well, you know, like uh, Little Willie John Stever and all that. We were doing all that uh, bopping. And I was dancing, and we were all having a rock and roll time playing the 50s, you know, cruising and all that. This was all a real part of my life. And the fan club was just like the, the, the you know, the icing on the cake. You know, that was all an, another whole thing going on. So basically, you know, we were just, you know, having fun, like teaming. We did, like, no, we hadn't had that much fun since, by the way, <laughs> um, <laughs> as we all know. Uh, so I got a letter from the same lady from Colonel Parker's office, and she, not knowing anything about Texas, you know, she knew I was in Dallas. This was in Dallas, Texas. I live in Dallas. And she says, well, the Colonel wanted uh, me to let you know that Elvis is going to be in Texas, in San Antonio, and if you would like to meet 
<laughs> How good is this kid? Huh? If you would like to meet him, uh, we can arrange it. He will send you a telegram, and that will get you backstage, and that you can meet him to so just let us know. <laughs> and, of course, the screaming, I ran into the house. Mother, you know, my, my mother was very supportive in all this. She loved Elvis, so boy, did that help. She she was cool, and just thought he was the greatest thing ever. So that really worked for me, too, because if I'd have had an alien parent, I'd have been in real big trouble. So... <laughs> I said, I said, so I wrote it back. I said, surely, you know, yes, yes, yes. I was back, but it was like over 200 miles away. It wasn't just down the street, and I'm just a teenager there by myself, you know, and I don't drive a car or anything yet. And so I happened to have a friend that had lived in San Antonio. From, we, we, used to, we lived there briefly when I was growing up. I still had a longtime friend that lived down there in Tina that remained a long, long, lifelong friend. And I told mother, I said, I could stay with Tina and her family if you just let me go. And so she agreed. And <laughs> so believe it or not, I just got on the Greyhound bus and put on, found that the sexiest dress I could find and the highest heels I could find, <laughs> the most dangly earrings I could find. <laughs> and I headed down the road. Uh, on the and counting every minute, and that's why my favorite song was trying to get to you because I I remember that as the, as every watching the, the the pavement on the bus, you know, it was like I'm on my way to see Elvis Presley. <laughs> we didn't call him Elvis then, and so I get there and uh, I go up to the front and I take my friend Tina with me, and because she's my age. And she, but she didn't like Elvis for some weird reason, but that's okay. She went along, and uh, I flashed the telegram to the guy at the stage door. He, you know, had Colonel Parker's name on it and all that. So they let me write in, and then Tom Deskin, who was Elvis's uh, traveling manager, stage manager, and right hand man to Parker, I said, "Oh, okay, great." He said, uh, "Elvis is in that room. Just go on in." <laughs> Just go on in. <laughs> Don't say that to me. Like, I'm just going to go on in. You know, I, I'm going to pass out here in about two seconds. Go, what do you mean, walk on in? And I looked at him with this incredible look. He said, yeah, just, just go ahead and open the door. So I opened the door, and there he is sitting in front of a mirror, and he's doing his smoothing out the duck tails, right? He's just sitting there. And so... I, it's just the two of us. It's this private dressing room. This is a, a little tiny, not big room at all. And he wheels around when he sees me walking up. He sees me in the barrel walking on in, and I'm terrified. And, of course, he's a thousand million times better looking in person mm -hmm. than any picture anybody had. And I am just, my heart is beating a thousand miles an hour, and I it's the closest thing to being paralyzed. <laughs> Right. Without without being sick or something. Another one of your favorite uh, songs, Paralyzed. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, you do that very well, by the way, uh, Peter. Uh, Peter Alden does that very well. All I can do is stand there paralyzed. And some people look at those pictures and, and see it looks like, you know, I'm very cool and collected, but no, I'm really paralyzed. People always say, how did you stay so calm with Elvis? I can tell you look real calm and at ease at home if they only knew. It was because I was just frozen. And, uh, you know, he, you know, walked to me. I, I said, I'm Kay Wheeler. I'm president of your fan club. <laughs> That's all I could think to say. He look, walks up to me with these piercing blue eyes and gets as close as he can. And he says, my fan club. <laughs> oh. And then he looks me up and down. And, you know, kind of, you know, does things that are not allowed in that day. And I said, you know, is that all you? Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm just ready to faint at this point. And then people come in. and Tina comes on in and, and starts taking the pictures. And, and, you know, it becomes a big, you know, free for all. And so, you know, we, we, we get, you know, we had some moments, private moments together that were very good. And, but when he was being interviewed by the press, when he said, why buy a cow when you can milk us through the fence and I'm not making this up, okay? That's when he answered that question. He was holding me in his arm, and I completely freaked out when he said that. Uh, that was one of the, you know, when they asked Elvis, are you ever going to get married? And, you know, and, and, and I, that was the 
he was holding me throughout the whole press conference. Wow. He never let go of me. He never let go of me. And when somebody said, you get married, he said, well, why buy a cow when he can go up after it? <laughs> and I thought, I will not be one of those cows. I was just, I was, yeah, was just going to say, <laughs> I haven't given any milk yet. So <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, but anyway, that, that was my first meeting with him. And that's when some of those great pictures that you see. Um, you know, on the Facebook and different on the internet. That that was that was the day. It was a real highlight day. And after that, I met him. You know, twice in Fort Worth and uh, Dallas, and uh, so and then in and Hollywood. And then both we ended up in Hollywood at the same time in '57. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, just more of the Memphis Flash. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you were responsible for getting him one of his biggest gigs at that point. And yeah, and yeah, 1956, you know, this was just his year. He had, he, and so by the time I met him in April, Heartbreak Hotel had come out and he was, had been on the stage show, uh, you know, the TV, the Jimmy Dar Tommy Darcy stage show. And uh, he had, ha he was skyrocketing. He was starting to skyrocket, but he was still not, a, you know, a household word totally yet, you know. And, uh, so he was still playing around Texas and in, in some venues that are not so great. But, but during that uh, San Antonio time I had with him, which another part of we went at between shows, he was doing two shows. We, we went to a back place where there was like a, an organ, like a you know pipe organ that you play. And he sat down and started playing songs. And so he sang Harbor Life and some other songs for me. And then other people came in later. But I had some nice moments with him. But he said... I said, well, when are you coming to Dallas? He says, well, the Cardinal says that we can't book Dallas. It's too big and there's problems with it, okay? I said, well, that's not, I said, this is where your main fan club is. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members there. And I said, you know, you've got to come to Dallas. I said, I, we'll get you to Dallas. Don't worry, somehow, some way. And I'm sure he was just thinking this is just a kid talking, you know. But as it turned out, I was able to get back to KLIF and my aunt, who was my great connection. Nothing like having a radio <laughs> station behind you, baby. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so I told her, I said, well, how would we ever get Elvis to Dallas? You know, he says he can't, but Parker can't get him in. She says, well, maybe if you get a big ride in, to the, get all the fans to ride into the radio station. And if enough letters come in, well, you know, we can book him. If you get enough letters, so that's all I was need to be told. So I attacked it like a, you know, like I was a political candidate running for office, and getting the letters to to come in, you know. Right. And so we started all writing letters. Everybody started writing. Like every kid, every color of envelope, every, you know, everybody started writing ten letters each, you know. And so they got enough letters, and so they teamed up with the State Fair of Texas to get the Cotton Bowl. They got so many letters that they knew they were going to need a big venue, and it was that time for the fair. So it kind of worked together. KLIF, along with the State Fair of Texas, sponsored Elvis to the Cotton Bowl, and he played October 11, 1956, to 26,500 paid tickets, which was the largest paid venue for most of his career, almost 20 years, until he did some kind of New Year's Eve a gig somewhere, I think it was a double concert, and they doubled up. But that held the record for like decades, at least over a decade, 15 years, of the largest paid venue that Elvis ever did. And it was all fan power, and that's wow. what I love. It was a ground, you know, with the ground level kids, you know, wanting Elvis and taking the power of the, fan, the Elvis fans, you know. they. We're, we're not the Elvis Presley Enterprises, and nothing wrong with that, but we weren't the colonel. We were the kids. Right. And that, that's nice. That's cute. You know? Yeah. I, it, that's, it's, well, it's, it's impressive, too. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, they let me, my reward for all this is that the colonel allowed me to be the only teenager out on the ball field, on the football field with Elvis. Elvis drove out on the field in, in his green coat. And a, and a white convertible, and there was a stage that they, you know, had a, just built just for the concert. And I was down there with my little brown, my little fifteen dollar brownie camera, and I was the only teenager allowed on the football field with him. The rest of the, the it, they had Bob wire, not Bob wire, but uh, some kind of wire fencing all across the front 
of the stadium so the, the kids couldn't rush down on the football field. And so that was, I thought that was a really, that was my big reward in life. And then, you know, at the press conference, uh, my mother, who loved Elvis, painted his portrait, which hangs in Graceland today. Oh, a painting. She's an art teacher. And uh, I, I got her in at the press conference to meet him. And we presented the painting to him at the press conference with all the flash bulbs going off. And where are these pictures? I have to ask myself. Wow. I mean, all the reporters that were there, every, you know, I just think where, there's so many missions, missing pictures and photos that I personally saw taken of Elvis by like 10 of 15 for top press photographers. And, he, and you don't worry, there's not one of Elvis backstage in San Antonio, for example. And there was probably 10, 10 photographers there. They were in the, in the press conference at the Cotton Bowl, there was a hundred of uh, people there. And there were so much, there was so much press, the Dallas Morning News, Dallas Times Herald, you know, various newspapers, Fort Worth Telegram, all that. Uh, they were all there, and I don't, there was not one photo of him in that in that uh, press conference except the little black and white ones I took of him. <laughs> wow, well, those <laughs> that's pictures are crazy. That's they, crazy. Well, they've got to yeah, be somewhere. I, 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 yeah, so yeah, that was a fun thing, and that was again fan power. It was fan power. I like that. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, I I forgot I was with Elvis. Speaking of another in Shreveport, at <laughs> the Louisiana Hayride. Yeah, yeah. I, almost forgot that one. That was the main one. Yeah, I went down there, and I think it, it was uh, December 15th. What's it meet with me in the 15th of 56? I <laughs> uh, was down at Shreve, uh, it was uh, December 15th, 1956, in Shreveport. It's the last Louisiana Hayride. Uh, I had an invitation to come down there, and I thought, well, could I go to Louisiana? I'm only 17, and you know, whatever. And I'd always lost my nerves with Elvis in a huge way. I mean, like, totally, I, I, there are no words to describe it, but all I could do was stand there paralyzed. <laughs> so I thought, I thought, well, I think I'm going down to Shreveport. Oh, I think I made Rock, Baby Rock at my movie, and, you know, by then, we shot that at the end of 1956, and I'd done a lot of television and radio things, and so I thought I had more confidence. And so I thought, oh... Well, I'll bop on down. I'll bop on down to Shreveport. <laughs> well, now let's not gloss over Rock Baby Rocket. That was the. I, I want you. To, I think everybody wants to hear about that. How did that come about? Well, the way that happened, uh, it had, had nothing to do with Elvis. Strangely enough, oh, it did. Uh, you know, they gave me a bigger part because of that. But later on, but the way it originally happened, Johnny Carroll, who was like a kind of an Elvis. It, you know, he loved Elvis, and he was trying to be another, uh, you know, an Elvis. And he, you know, Johnny Carroll, I don't know if he's ever heard yeah, of him. Yeah, I, 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 From Fort Worth. And so he, they were playing Rock Around the Clock movie at the, at the Palace Theater in downtown Dallas. And so they were going to have an in-between, you know, intermissions and stuff. Johnny Carroll was going to play there, okay? And so we saw it in the paper and saw a friend of mine said, let's go down there. We can, we can dance. You know, there's going to be a rock thing. And I said, oh, okay, that sounds fun. So when Johnny Carroll uh, started playing, I just got up and started doing, you know, my natural bopping thing I always do with the parties and different things at my house when we'd have the Elvis parties or the rock and roll parties. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah, maybe. It's still kind of wild. <laughs> you can do it. You're still not sure how to rate it when you watch it. Um, so I just got up there and started doing it, and so the guy just put a spotlight on me. The other kids were dancing, it wasn't just me. It was all, you know, they all started dancing in the aisles. And so I was just dancing the, what I call the rock and bop, and uh, they put a spotlight on me, and that was it. And, oh, boy, that's fun, and it was over and thought nothing about it. I was leaving the theater, so this crazy-looking guy comes running up to me, and he said, hey, hey, hey. I said, what? He said, uh, he came up to me, and this is like a classy hey, come on that you would think. And, of course, I wasn't smart to know what, what a come on was anyway. But he said, we're going to be making a movie here in Dallas, a rock and roll movie with Johnny Carroll. And he said, would you possibly do that dance that you did in there for this movie? And I looked at him like, 
Are you crazy? I mean, he was a weird looking guy. Okay, he was strange. <laughs> I mean, he was like, and of course, we're teenagers and we don't trust anybody over 30 or even 20, maybe. So, you know, it's like he was really batting up the wrong, uh, uh, walking up the wrong girl here. And he said, here, here's my card. Here's my card. Take this card. He said, call this number and you can be in this movie. And of course, I thought, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And so I go home and I had it to my, like everything, I had it to my mother. <laughs> I'm a mother's daughter. I'm, and my mother was like my whole best friend forever. And, and you know, she would always tell me the, the good and the bad and the ugly about everything. So I said, Mother, what? this guy came up and told me again. She said, oh, well, she said, I'll say that. She said, it's probably nothing. You know, just kind of laughed at it. So then she sees this advertisement in the Dallas. It, it, it's not an advertisement amusement section of the paper that says uh, P- rock and roll movie to be filmed in Dallas, okay? Mm-hmm. And then she read it, She and it said, you know, Top Ten Music, which was the name of it on the card, on the little the wooden nickel card, and she comes running in to me. She, my mother's always coming running in to me now, and I think about it with those letters on the front porch, and now there, she says, no, she says, they are making a movie. This is this card. It's the same people that the guy told you. She said, you ought to go over there. See, she was always there. She was my manager. Wow. And I said, I said, oh, okay. So one day, you know, we, she, we went, I went over there to the dress of the thing. And I just walked in and there Johnny Carroll was practicing this horrible place. It was like red carpet, shag carpet and all these wires and musicians and everything scary for, for me, you know, for a young teenage girl. And, you know, he was doing what I kind of thought was a bad uh, version of Elvis. <laughs> so anyway, it, and I, but I don't think that now, but at the time, you know, it was, everything was Elvis. You know, there was just nothing. You couldn't look at anybody but him. And so I said, oh, well, what's this? You know, and then I found that guy. Then I saw the guy come in that had met me, and I said, here's the card you gave me. I said, I'm Kay Wheeler. Uh, I'll, do the, I'll do the dance if you're going to do a movie. And he said, okay, right away. So, you know, that was all hooked up right then. And I said, um, and later on, I said, by the way, I have a huge Elvis Presley fan club, uh, you know, that might be interested in seeing this movie too, you know. And so that's how, why they put it into the movie. Now the the girl who's president of the largest rock and roll fan club, mm. they added that. <laughs> yeah, they, and, and, of course, I hated the movie. I was horrified at the movie it was wasn't in color it wasn't you know i'm thinking why did i ever make this movie it's going to haunt me for the rest of my life you know i didn't think like that but i thought i'm going to hollywood and i'm not going to make black and white movies like this and it's crazy you know i just i just did i didn't get paid for it i got i bought me a pontiac hardtop convertible with money from that it wasn't a lot but it was more than we had it. It was my first car. Mm. So, you know, uh, that movie was e- exciting. And, you know, it turned into some kind of cult, cult rock and roll classic, even around the world, more in like foreign countries in Europe, like Russia, and people that didn't weren't in on the rock and roll of the 50s. It's kind of like a, it's almost a documentary because it has actual kids doing the actual dancing, not choreographed by Hollywood, you know. When Hollywood gets a hold of it, it turns into a Broadway kind yes, of flip yes. flop type thing, and it loses its real roots of, of the real rock and roll and, and the real the real dancing that the kids did in those days. Mm-hmm. I noticed that when I made the movie with Gene Vincent, Hot Rod Gang in Hollywood, that was a that happened from Rock Baby Rocket. Some producers and people in Hollywood saw the Rock Baby Rocket and offered me a movie contract with American International. At that time, they made all these weird, I was a teenage werewolf and the flying saucer teens, and they made, uh, it was, a, they made a whole lot of, Michael Landon was in a lot of their films, and they made a lot of strictly teenage movies, and, uh, they gave me a movie contract and said if I would go out to Hollywood. And then, I, of course, I said, Mother, um, <laughs> <laughs> I go to my mother, and she says, well, you have to be graduated from high school. You're not going anywhere without that. Mm-hmm. And so I said, so I waited. I didn't do anything. And even into the summer, you know, I still wasn't 100% sure about going out to Hollywood. And I certainly was not going to go without mother. Okay. So that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. 
So we we did make up our mind. We arranged to get out to Hollywood. We drove to Hollywood in that Pontiac that I bought with a Rock Baby Rock movie. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because piled in the car. Hollywood, here we come. You know. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm trying to imagine what's going through your head at this time. You're what, sixteen, seventeen years old. You've met Elvis Presley. You've got a brand new car. You're in the movies now. <laughs> hey, what are you going to do for an encore? <laughs> yeah, when I came back from Hollywood at 19, it, and, and it was like, what, do you, what, what next? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I was delighted to find Rock Baby Rocket on YouTube, so I'm going to include a link for anybody that's interested to, to uh, watch it. It's really neat to watch. It's so bad that it's great. The other day, the other day, the other day a, a couple of years back, a theater in Oakland, California, decided to put it on the big screen, okay, wow. and, and have a special show, and they invited me over for a Q&A question and answer after the movie, mm -hmm. and it was, the, what really stood out to me when I saw it on the big screen again, uh, well, it was, it's been very carefully preserved in black and white. It's that very, very good condition for a film that old. And what struck me was the music. You know, the black groups. There was some, you know, uh, there was some Roscoe Garden, I think he is. He, he ended up being a big star. And, uh, the music and the pure rock and roll of it in the kids' dancing, that, that just came off like, Gangbusters, you know, <laughs> yeah. like Godzilla, like Godzilla, you're coming out like Godzilla. That's one of the lines of the movie. Uh, you know, it, it really that you know. Then I think from that standpoint, and per, you know, just preserving like a, it's like a perfect cap time capsule almost of a lot of of the world that these teenagers on film, and, and not they did splice in some Hollywood stuff in there. I can tell you where it is, some teenage, but we won't even go there. But anyway. Now I'm real proud of it, and I think it's, it's cute and fun, and people seem to get a lot of fun out of it, and that, that makes me happy. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, going back to Elvis and the time that you spent with him, let everybody know, what did you think of Elvis, his music, his career, his personality, all of that stuff as a person that got to be with him and be around him in person? Of course, you know, like all the girls are that time we were madly in love with Elvis I mean this was just like <clears throat> it was as normal as apple pie in the fourth of July mm -hmm. you know, uh, for a lot of the girls and and you know uh, he of course was immediately I knew it was totally out of reach and it was a joke you know and he had all these beautiful girls and you know I uh, I had a good figure but I wasn't conventionally beautiful or any of that and I'm thinking eh, eh, eh. and you know so I knew better than to have any real thoughts about Elvis, you know. I knew I knew immediately right away that that wasn't going to be. I think that Elvis, I think that the original Elvis was the real Elvis throughout all his life. And I think a lot of us, you know, once we get our minds formed and we're like in our 20s and from our teens, mm -hmm. I think we kind of who we are. We will change. We'll, some people get bitter. They get hurt from life, et cetera, and so and th changes do happen. Mm -hmm. But basically, we're always in conflict with who we really are and how we can demonstrate that, how we can live that out in our lives in a very restricted society. Mm -hmm. So I think Elvis was, I do think Elvis was the Memphis Flash. I think Elvis was the rebel without a cause. I think Elvis was Marlon Brando in the wild one. And this was the Elvis that I saw in 1956 when he was saying, why buy a cow when you can go to a fish? Now, he would never say that again past 1956. Right, <laughs> right. right. Not in public. Let's get that right. <laughs> and so he basically was, he was the wild, he was the, you know, he was the, he represented freedom. I mean, when you were afraid to wear different color of socks to school, you had to wear white bobby socks. If you wore pink bobby socks, everybody would look at you like you're crazy. Hmm. It was still very restrictive. And so Elvis comes out there in a pink jacket, you know, and wears every kind of stripe, wears his hair longer. So basically, he, that was his, uh, he was rolling up his rebel flag, you know, of freedom. And I think that's, I think that he had a hard time restricting the real Elvis to fit into the mold that Colonel Parker in the movies and Parker wanted him to be acceptable, you know, and he thought that would sell more tickets 
you know, for his dancing there. And so mm -hmm. I think Elvis never really, and when he would really let go in Las Vegas where, or whenever he was dancing for just a few minutes, we would always say, what is that? You know, every once in a while he'd just lean back and really dance and do what he really felt inside. And it was something from another planet almost. You went, how can he move that fast? How, obviously he's got a lot inside him that's very pent up. Well, and, uh, you know, you would see glimpses of it throughout the rest of his career, but I think, I think also that I think that his mother gave him affirmation and love because that was uh, the child that lived, you know, when he was born in tragedy, there was a dead baby next to him, yeah. you know. Yeah, we're and, talk and, a so lot about I, his and mom. I think, <laughs> yeah, he said, and I think that the family was a, uh, they were they were a family of faith. They sang together, they prayed together, and in their poverty and what they didn't have, what they did have is their faith and their their connection to each other. And uh, you know, the, and I think he had the ultimate affirmation from his mother growing up and. Nobody was ever going to come near that. I don't even think the affirmation from the fans really gave him the love that she gave how, somehow or another. And we've all had certain parents, and you know, you know that the affirmation that our parents can give us can make a big difference in our life. I don't think he really ever found that in a personal relationship. Maybe, and I'm just speculating, or or even with us the fans. Mm -hmm. But I think the closest he could come was when we were all screaming and saying, we love you, and he's up on the stage. I mean, that's a lot of ad adoration going on there. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, I think that uh, he really kind of uh, had to, you know, not be himself in some of these movies. Some of them were good, and some of them were bad. But he was conforming. I guess the word I'm going for is conforming. He came out of the gate a while Buck and Bronco, mm -hmm. and by the, you know, and like they grabbed, like when Parker got him, then, you know, Parker starts trying to civilize him and make him not who he really, yeah. really was, so I think he was, and of course, you know, fame and fortune doesn't bring happiness, but I think he, he was just a kid trying to please everybody, and he was a very trying to please everybody person, even with little old me, you know, when I told him I was his fan club president, at one point he said, well, tell me what you want me to do. And, and, of course, when he sang that in the 1968 special, that black leather outfit on him where he says, you know, baby, tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> I go, I always go back to that moment. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, my gosh, if I could have seen you then, I, you know. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think he had a, a lot of tragedy, and I think he had a, a lot of uh, spiritual he was a very, I think he obviously was a spiritual person. Yes. Well, I, I know you wanted to get to that. We talked about this in our preliminary conversation. Um, there is part of the legacy of Elvis that you wanted to share and tell us about the gospel and spiritual side of Elvis. You feel like that's more of a legacy than almost anything. The black leather and the rebellious side and all of that. Um, tell us about how you feel about that. Well, I think that's a lot of the real Elvis. But, you know, you know, Jesus was uh, a revolutionary. He he didn't say anything that anybody, he he wasn't like nobody. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm comparing the two, but I'm, I'm saying that, you know, it's not necessarily a conflict with not following all the com, conform, counsel, you know, conforming to the society mm -hmm. to say, you know, I'm not, I'm, uh, you can still be a rebel and not conform to society. I think that, uh, I think that, you know, that he always had the bedrock of what he, he had experienced something in those church services with his parents when he went that had something to it because he always drew on that uh, with his gospel songs and, you know, including, you know, hymns and, and what other artists ever put there, you know, uh, how great thou art in his regular, did Frank Sinatra ever do that in his nightclub shows, you know. Elvis always wanted to make a point that he had some faith and a faith background, however derailed it might have gotten from time to time. And I think that derailment is what worries Gladys Presley. Mm -hmm. uh, even at the Audubon house, I, I mentioned that she didn't seem all that happy about everything that was going on at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know... Um, other people have done some research and said she was alarmed at the, the girls that were coming around the house.
house, you know, and young girls and that kind of stuff. I mean, I, any mother would say the world could swallow up my son here easily, you know. Yeah. And I think I think she probably is kind of happy as she was, I guess, about the financial uh, part of their lives being so approved. I think she was concerned about his his future, and especially that's her only surviving child. And if you ever talk to anybody that's lost a child, and I know what a heartache it is. My sister uh, lost her her teenage son at 17 to leukemia. Oh, and you're never you're never the same. You're never the same. You're you're always hurting inside, and you go on with life because God gives you the grace to do that. But I think that Gladys Presley carried that pain with her, and I think that when she saw her surviving son. And anything that looked like it might derail him or hurt him in the future, I think she was alarmed. Mm-hmm. I think she was alarmed. And I think maybe as we look back on it, rightfully so. Yeah, and, and I want to get into that with you because you have an amazing insight and got to spend time with Gladys that probably nobody else really has, definitely that we have talked to so far. Maybe um, no fan, no fan. Maybe, yeah, you know, yeah. Based on some of fan bases. Yeah. Exactly. Um but before we get to that, I want to squeeze in something else um, because one of the first things that you and I talked about, Kay, even before Elvis, uh, we talked about Peter Alden. And um, <laughs> <laughs> Peter Alden Do has, I need to leave the room? Yeah, now? you need to leave the room. Um, no, you can stay. Uh, <laughs> but Kay, you mentioned um, you wanted to share with everyone how you met Pete, what you said to him at that time, the project you guys worked on together. All that good stuff. Will you talk about that with everybody while he leaves the room? He's so embarrassed. <laughs> well, you know, so many people. Uh, I used to go down to Las Vegas for the rockabilly uh, uh, convention. I used to have a Viva Las Vegas. I still do once a year, and I used to do more of that than I do now. But uh, so many people would say, well, ask me the question. It's just like you did. What was it like to meet Elvis the first time? What did you think? What did you mm-hmm. think? How was it? How was the combo? So I thought, you know, I think I'll just make a little CD and, and, and record it, and then I can just give somebody that, and that way they have the whole story. At least at least I'll get it down somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, get it. And so I thought, I, that was my first thought. I thought I'll do something like that. That way we were, I wasn't on Facebook, and the Internet wasn't as big as it is, you know, so... It was like I didn't really have a way to express myself unless somebody interviewed me on a television program or something. So I decided, so I was, we were down at Las Vegas for, um, I think it was at the, was, was it the Lady Luck? Yeah. Was it the Lady Luck? It seemed like it was the Lady Luck. Was it Elvis? Yeah. It was, uh, it, tribute, tribute Artist Convention is what it was. Yep, down at the and Amazon, I was gonna, Fremont Street. I was going to, they, they'd ask me to dance. I, it, it, this is, I'm in my 60s, okay, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never see that. We'll never see that again. You got a lot of nerve, baby. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll see these Elvis. And, and the first thing, I, my, my sister, I, my mother passed away. And so the next one I go to is my sister right next to me. And I say, you know, if we, if I do a CD, I'm going, I like to have some music by, behind it. So it kind of represent the different times I met him, which was all of 1956, except for 57 at Jailhouse Rock in Hollywood. And so I said, well, let me, we, we can't use Elvis's music. That would cost a million dollars, 10 million. And so I thought, well, we'll just, maybe we'll see what, what, what's here at this convention and maybe there'll be some music we could use on the, our, on the CD. So, you know, and then when I heard Peter, he did the 50, not every, all of them were doing the Las Vegas mostly because that was, of course, he had more exposure in his Las Vegas career than he did in the 50s in, in the main media for the, the you know, as time progressed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Peter was doing the Elvis 50s, you know, with a pink jer- shirt on and all that and the black coat and, and he seemed to have the mood and the and the the feeling of Elvis, you know, better than anybody that I had seen. And so I recruited. I asked him at that time. I said, I, if I do a CD, would you would you let me use some of your music? And you know, we kind of went back and forth. And I think I think Peter Alden did the best fifty Elvis of any of the anybody I've heard. I love it. I love it. I'm gonna start putting that on all the literature. <laughs> yeah, and believe me, I was there, and I and I yeah, I used it. And, and, and then he 
PPE thought I'd actually used Elvis Presley's music, and they sent me a letter and said, you can't use Elvis Presley's music on your uh, your CD. Of course, this was some, you know, somebody that was a pretty square, probably. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I called them up. I said, that's not Elvis Presley's music, please. And I said, but thank you for the compliment. <laughs> that's a nice thing that that's a nice thing to say anyway. Yeah. So I'll let you know that happened. So that, that and I think I was right about that. I think uh, I also think that you know some people have the thing. Oh well, you know there'll never be an Elvis, and I, you know people that are doing what Elvis did, you know tribute artists or whatever you want to call them. You know there's nothing like Elvis. Well, everybody knows there's nothing like Elvis. That's like saying, you know, there's nothing like air. You know, <laughs> we all know that. No, and, you want but Elvis. the point, but I think, I think that he would just totally flip if he could see how many people are remembering him by his music, by doing singing like he does and, and capturing his look and feel. I think he would be so. And they didn't do that for like Valentino. They didn't do that for Frank Sinatra. <laughs> they only did it for Elvis. You know, Elvis is just a, a groundbreaker. And I, who, who could imagine that there would be all these? I went to that convention and there was all these Elvises. I mean, mm-hmm. what a dream! How could you get? How, did they get any better? <laughs> I mean, did they get any better for anybody who really loves Elvis? And how anybody that really loves Elvis like Elvis, any way you can get him. Yeah, you know, yeah. on a T-shirt, on a coffee cup, or and most of all, live somebody up there dancing and singing. In fact, at our Elvis club, we would get we would get up and try to dance like Elvis. So we would my my sister she would imitate Elvis, and we would all scream. So this has been going on from day day one with Elvis Presley. <laughs> well, if you can't get him, if we can't bring him back from the dead. At least we can go see a great a tribute artist do some wonderful songs and, and dances and make us feel like we were at Elvis concert. That's as close as you guys are ever going to get because he's not here anymore. So yeah. that's what I have to say about it. I say I wish every guy went around acting like Elvis. That would make my life happier than I could ever tell you. Well, and you have a even, great story. Even, even at, excuse me, even at this age, it would still make me happy. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, and you have a great story about Elvis hearing sort of a tribute, and you were there, and you saw his reaction. Will you tell that story? No, no. I took a picture of a girl, actually, doing an Elvis imitation. If you, I, There's nothing wrong with that word for me, but anyway, some people don't like it. And I showed it to him once. I think it was in Fort Worth. And... Uh, he, I said, this is the girl, and she's doing an imitation of you. And he grabbed it with an 8 by 10 picture. He grabbed it, he said, man, he, he was like going crazy. I saw that, he took it out of my hand, grabbed it out of my hand. <laughs> and he called Scotty over there, and he said, come here, look at this. He said, this is somebody doing an imitation of me. He thought it was the most fabulous thing he'd ever seen. He's like, he said, can I have this? I said, yeah. I said, sure. And so he takes it and sticks it in the top of that leather guitar case up in the, the top part. Somehow or another, he had it, he could poke it in something that he had to say. So I don't think he was mad, but he was thrilled to death about it. Aww. It was a highlight. It was, mm-hmm. a, I'll never forget it. And, and whoever thought, I mean, I saw that, that was in 1956. Uh, I think it was in April, right after the San Antonio. He invited me to come to the Fort Worth after the San Antonio meeting. And it was right at, it's in that same month. Hmm. And uh, so for anybody, the naysayers, I don't think Elvis would be mad at all. I think he would be smiling from ear to ear. I love, love that story. And you've got another great story. So I promised everybody we'd get to this part. So exciting. You got to spend about six hours with Gladys Presley, Elvis's mom. So will you tell everybody how did that happen? And uh, tell, take us through that day with you. Yeah, I, it was uh, it was unplanned. Uh, I had to be in Memphis uh, to do a photo shoot with Barbara Hearn and uh, Sixteen Magazine. And uh, in fact, I had the magazine. They, they took a spread of pictures with it, and <clears throat> so the opportunity came to go see Gladys Presley and the conversation. Something that I somebody said I don't know whether it was they. The photographer, the editor, the guy doing a story, or who had happened to that, I can hook you up to go see 
we didn't say hook you up. If you want to meet God Presley, we can, you know, work something out while you're here. I might have said it, it was just I'm gonna. I might have said I'm just gonna go by the house and you know, you know. And they might have said, well, you know, we can arrange it. Something was arranged, uh, and she knew who I was because my mother's portrait that she painted, that uh, mother had painted that was was hanging in the living room and. Is so that she, the one? I hate that. to interrupt you, but I gotta know now. The picture that you're talking about is that the one that's over the staircase at Graceland? No, no, it's in the room. It's in the port. It's right when you're leaving Graceland, and there's a picture, a portrait of Gladys Presley, and the one next to it is the one my mother painted. The little gold uh, thing from the Dallas fan club, the uh, National fan club, is right there on the painting at the bottom. It's still there. It's still there. Okay, great. Thanks it's for clearing like that up. Is. Yeah, now we'll know when yeah. we go. Okay. <laughs> and actually, the, the interesting little side note here is that portrait looks an awful lot like Lisa Marie Presley more mm. than Elvis. Wow. It, 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 it's, pretty, it's startling mm -hmm. that my mother, or my mother painted it, I said, well, mother, that's not a general picture that you see Elvis. You know, if it wasn't, it wasn't a straight front look, you, you know, the most, that she caught something else. And Elvis, that, in fact, I wasn't even sure that I liked it, okay? <laughs> I liked it, but it didn't look exactly like Elvis, mm. you know. And now that I look at it, it, it's pretty amazing how much it looks like Lisa Marie Presley. It's mm. totally amazing. So my mother saw something in Elvis, I guess, that we didn't, that I couldn't see. But, yeah, I'll have uh, to so, see so, long story short, it was, uh, it, she knew I was coming, but it was just spontaneous. It was the... Uh, and so I just, you know, knocked on the door at Audubon, and she opened the door, and she was like the nicest, you know, just like family. I mean, she treated me just like she was my auntie or, you know. Of course, the South, Southern people are awfully sweet like that. That's just the way they're personable, generally. <clears throat> and she was just real um, open and <clears throat> inviting me in and, you know, just, you know, was great, gracious, and you know, thanking me for all I'd done for Elvis and all that. She took me to the whole house and uh, with a private, personal tour, and uh, we talked. And she wanted to fix me lunch and different things like that. And so, you know, it was just a, a remarkable thing. She let me go through the, everything in his closet, and uh, so and his cars and motorcycles and everything. And so we got some photos. It was just an overall pretty thing. But she, the last thing she mentioned to me was, you know, I, she said, she first she said, you know, you know, you really remind me of myself when I was young. Wow. And she even mentioned something about wanting to be a dancer. I said, vaguely, it comes back to me. I said, oh, really? I, I danced some, you know. And uh, she said, uh, do you really think Elvis does drugs? This was in 1956, it's in November, mm. okay? And this was way back then. She was already concerned. And she said, some of these magazines and things, they write and say that Elvis does drugs and things like that. And she looked at me really intense. She said, like I was going to know something. Mm. She said, he doesn't really do drugs. Elvis doesn't do drugs. And I said, you know, we can't pay attention to what people people write, right. but I think that when she was concerned right out of, as we said, Texas, the get go there, wow. uh, mm. I could see the concern on her face, <clears throat> but she, you know, uh, Verna was there, he was obsessed with a swimming pool, he was, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, that's a crack in the swimming pool, because they had filled it up with water uh, too soon, before the cement got really cured as they say and they caused a crack he was there with all the workmen and they were all, you know i just met him in passing helen mrs presley but you know he he wasn't in the house and she you know she didn't seem a real happy person mm -hmm. the word for her is unhappy that would be what i would get that but you know people talk about i didn't see any evidence of any kind of drinking or smell anything and, you know, my dad was a big drinker, and I'm big on knowing how alcohol smells, mm. <laughs> okay? Well, I grew up with it, honey. Yeah. And there wasn't, you know, a lot of people say things like, I've heard different rumors and stuff like that, but from my, what my experience was, and that, those hours that I spent with him, uh, we just, uh, 
I didn't smell anything or even hint of anything or see a bottle of anything anywhere in the house. So, mm. for whatever that's worth. And she was just great. She is, you know, the, the gold uh, records were sitting there in a big stack, and I just started picking them up. And, of course, I can talk forever, so as you catching on here. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, she and I, we just got in conversation after conversation after conversation. You know, we talked about the oil painting, who it looked like, who, what she thought of it, so forth and so on, what I thought of the other you know, the dog, she, she had a little sweet pea with her. Mm-hmm. We were just like, uh, you know, it was just like I was visiting my auntie, mm-hmm. you know, and we were just sitting, just, just, it was a feeling of family, mm-hmm. I can say that, a real true warm feeling of family, and I'll never forget that. And I'm so glad that Elvis was on tour, because otherwise I'd have never got that mm-hmm. opportunity with her, Yeah, you know. It's a very... I always, lose, I always lose, my, lose my nerve with Elvis. So if that wouldn't have been any good, I'd probably swung in there and flown out of there for like 15 seconds. You're right. so. Well, but what are you... But what are, I, hey, excuse me. I know what you run from. <laughs> Well, you know, it's just, it's it's such a unique experience that very few fans had 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 the chance to do to, to really just get to know her. Well, maybe I did it for a, a lot of the fans, you know. That's just good because it is a fan story. It's not a Carl Parker story. It's not a girlfriend story. A lot of people say girlfriend because he's like, he's loving up on me and all that, and and of course, I would love to be the girlfriend, but I never played that role. I never played that role with Elvis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I had some moments with him and date with him in three, four. Um, he had I a picture of you, me. right? He had, you, you, he had a picture of you, right? Yeah, he had a picture of me on his nightstand. Can I you imagine? One, I, I, listen, <laughs> listen to this line. <laughs> I wasn't a one night stand. I was a nightstand. <laughs> <laughs> she was on the nightstand. <laughs> I was exactly a nightstand. I thought that was funny because one of my lines is, "Oh, I would never, I was never going to be a one night stand," you know. <laughs> and uh, well, I was playing for keeps with him, man. They wasn't, I wasn't messing around. With, I mean, he was like a keeper in a real big way. Mm-hmm. But you know, I went about to be some one of those. Yeah. No. Yeah, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> That well, wasn't going to happen. Even if I had to be the only one that happened to got away, at least I set out his mind for something. Right, so, right. You know, well, good for you. So, <laughs> so yeah, well, I've regretted like three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight is twenty twenty. <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm glad. No, whatever it is, I mean, I'm glad. I mean, it's okay. It's okay. And uh, because there's nothing like an unfinished story, is there? I I've got a quick question. As long as we're on the subject of Gladys, and I, I don't know that um, anybody's asked her if they have. I've never seen it. Did she have any songs of his that she just really adored? We did not talk about that. I don't know. I can't answer. I, no, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. I think they probably like the country and western side of more, like trying to get to you, Milk Cow Blues, Boogie, you know, that kind of, I think Vernon, I think, what we, I think Vernon likes trying to get to you is his favorite, what's his favorite song. Okay. So, so I think that probably the more country and western and gospel than the show tunes like he did in Vegas and some of the the tunes like Bridge Over Trouble Water, which is are really unbelievable, but you know they're not the roots tunes, the Elvis roots tunes, you know, of the gospel and the country and western where he sprang out of the original stuff. But that that's just a guess. That's just a guess. But you know, I think that the main thing that you could see that it, 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 having a mother like that with that adoration and all that, I know uh, you never really get it that much from anybody ever again. And you're lucky if you get it from one. Mm-hmm. If you're lucky, count yourself lucky. Uh, but you're never going to go searching probably and find anything comparable mm-hmm. with the kind of just unconditional love, you know, that Gladys had for him as her son, you know. And now that I have a son... I understand that totally. And, of course, when my son started talking about going into rock and roll music, I started having a heart attack. Hmm. I thought, oh, no, this cannot happen. So, you know. You totally because look what happened to Elvis. Yeah. I, I, I you know. 
and he kind of holds that against me to this minute, you know, but I, for just a moment, I could feel a little bit of the anxiety and the concern, you know, you don't want your kid to get in something that's not going to be really good for him or kill him, you know, right at the end of the day. Yeah, so what's your life like now, Kay? You mentioned you have a son, and I understand you're in real estate. What if I want to buy a house in California? How do I find Kay Wheeler? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> just pull up, pull up uh, uh, Google, and there's like about four pages, and hidden among there somewhere, it says Kay Wheeler Realtor. Mm -hmm. And you just click that, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, my son's with me with a Wheeler team. We're at Century 21. We've been at Century 21 for 26 years. Wow. And uh, we we got really blessed here in real estate in, in San Jose, California. My daughter, Anna, I have a, a beautiful daughter, Anna, and she's also in real estate. So uh, we just have our, our lives here. I work on uh, books. I'm working on several gospel books, compilations of the scriptures. I've done some of these before for uh, Thomas Nelson Publishing. They've, they've, been, they've been distributed 11 million copies sold. Wow. around the world mm -hmm. and of course I didn't get those royalties so don't get excited here <laughs> but I, I did them for like a flat fee type of thing mm -hmm. but uh, the royalties I was supposed to have gotten more but it's a long story you know never mind but mm -hmm. anyway I'm working on several of those and I'd like to get those finished before I leave this planet and they're big tasks they're big projects yeah. Yeah. and of course I would just love to someday um, see the Elvis story and the fan club and the Rod Baby Rockets and all the fun things and even the Gene Benson and, and Jen, you know, Eddie Cochran and all the people that I met in Hollywood. A good rock and roll, you know, American graffiti rock and roll style with music and, you know, Elvis and all the, my story. I'd like to see it done in a film. I think it would be, I think it would be fun mm -hmm. and I think it would be positive. I'd like to see that happen maybe before I leave because I especially want to be sure that Dan thinks right. Yeah, yeah. choreograph that thing. <laughs> I, I want to live long enough to be sure I get the dancing right in it. Would we shoot it in color and black and white? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we can go color. And let, now that we've mentioned it, we cannot put that brown tint on the screen to try to make it look like an antique table. You know, the, what is it? In the 1950s, color was brighter. There was no pollution. Everything was technicolor. Elvis was Technicolor. Everything that was happening was bright. You don't. It, and when they did these nostalgia films, even uh, uh, when they did the Frankie Valley, one as great as I love these shows, I can't stand it when they put the uh, the beige tint on the film. It's called an antiquing or something that they do on it. They didn't do it in the Johnny Cash story, which was great, and they didn't do it in the Ray Charles story. But they kind of used that to try to age it. And they even did it on the television special that they did, the Sun Records thing. You don't have to do, if you can't get your set decorators and your costuming enough to bring people into that time frame, then don't just spray brown on the film and think you're <laughs> going to antique the story. Right. I would have to say that, and that's not on topic, but I, that drives me wild. Yeah, we will. I want to live long enough to keep that from happening. <laughs> well, Kay, we certainly appreciate uh, all your time. Um, uh, you know, getting a, getting a chance to get another unique. We we're enjoying these interviews because we're getting a lot of different and unique uh, uh, memories of Elvis that you the, some that you don't get in the books or in the. Uh, the official storyline just to getting a chance to talk to real people that knew him and and it's just amazing how we and when we when we first started doing these we thought well we got to come up with like all these questions and thankfully everyone that's that's known him is just as soon as you start asking about Elvis Presley the the stories just come out and it's amazing to us that we, we, now we only have like two or three questions for the, oh my gosh, these people better talk. So that so. Well, you, you just have such an amazing, beautiful, unique perspective being there right in the beginning, spending so much time with this mom. And we're just, we just feel so blessed and so lucky to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for your time and sharing with us. I would never believe, after all these years, that I would still be talking about Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. what a great topic. And yes. you just all of a sudden you feel about 20 years younger when you start talking mm -hmm. about it. So 
It's my pleasure, actually. My pleasure. Well, thank you so much, We appreciate much, it very much, Kay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Blessings. All right. All right, everybody, we hope you enjoyed this pre-recorded video, our phone interview earlier this week with the fantastic, beautiful, awesome Kay Wheeler. Thank you so much for watching live. We will be putting the video up on YouTube in its original form, so it's going to be a nice, clear, beautiful uh, video for you guys to watch for years to come, hopefully. Um, and uh, we appreciate you tuning in live. Hey, Mario's here. Hello, hello. Thank you guys so much. Um, um, this Tuesday coming up, we'll be back to a regular news, Elvis news episode. Be lots and lots of fun. And then the following week after that, I believe our next special guest interview will be none other than Miss Marion Cock. Of course, Elvis's personal nurse and dear friend. Elvis bought her a car and um, she spent many nights with him, taking care of him. Um, she, she loved him like a son, even though it wasn't, he was only about 10 years younger than her. But, uh, thank you all for watching live. We appreciate you so much. Hi, Kay's watching. Hello, Kay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope we did your interview justice. Thank you so much for watching live. And you guys have a fantastic evening. Happy Halloween, by the way. And we'll see you right back here again on Tuesday. Same time, same place. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, check us out over at TCB Radio Network work.com. Love you guys. See you next week. All right. See you later. Bye.